Hello, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Burn Your Draft, an exploration of the Reed College senior thesis process and experience. I'm your host, Frank Tangerlini, and this week we'll be speaking with Saga Darnell. Media is media is media. Today we'll hear from Saga on their theater thesis performance reflecting on 10 years of queer representation in film and television. My name is Saga Darnell. I am from, I guess, like most recently, I grew up mostly in uh, Northern Alberta in Canada, and I'm an interdisciplinary dance theater major. And I finished my thesis, which is great. Um, <laughs> and my thesis title is Our Beds Are Islands, Creating it Queer Intimacy Through Physical Theater in the Age of Streaming Media. Nice. It's a cool thesis title. So what is it about? So basically I was investigating like, the ways that queer intimacy has been portrayed in like on-screen media in the last 10 years. So like since the rise of like streaming platforms um, and with that, like a lot of like the elimination of like a lot of barriers to what content can be created. So how like queer physical intimacy has changed in depiction over that time. And then I used physical theater basically like as a lens through which to like look at those and observe those and create uh, new depictions of like queer physical intimacy on stage that both like reflected like community and like queer physical intimacy in real life and like how that is skewed by media and also like push back and resist against like the stereotypes and like the negative ways that queer intimacy has been portrayed on screen before. What are some of the changes in media depiction and in streaming sites that were talked to like that you talked about so mostly i analyzed like themes that i like picked i watched like a ton of media last summer and like picked out like things that i saw happening over and over again but i think like the biggest change overall is like there's more sex now there's like more (laughs) there's more of everything um and i feel like that's like that's not a thing that you like need to watch very much to see right like i feel like whenever i show my parents anything on tv um or like on netflix they're like this is like just sex and it's like because (laughs) there aren't these barriers anymore of like the same kinds of like ad revenue and like having things on cable and network television like one time and so you have to put things like only at certain like times of night like could sex be portrayed like let alone queer sex and and so that has all really shifted and like the the ways that we rate things has shifted because like there used to be all of these barriers to I'm using that word a lot but um there used to be all of these barriers to like getting in the movie theater you know Mm -hmm. so there's this thing called the Hayes Code um in much of like the 20th century that was like explicitly homophobic and racist and like basically set out rules for what could be depicted on screen um and that included like no queer physical touch that like was depicted as like enjoyable or like moral or okay it included no like physical intimacy between like people of different races or ethnicities it was like a horrible horrible document that basically determined everything that was put on screen until like the mid 1960s. Was that code used for movie theaters or also within TV and cable television? So all of those things is like my understanding, but when it was like struck down, it was replaced by what we have now, which is the rating system um, that we see of like PG-13, NC-17, like R, whatever. And that determines like who can get in the movie theater, right? And that board, like the the board of like white men who run that, <laughs> there are they don't have any published guidelines for how they rate things. So like everything is rated completely independent of like outside input. And when they rate things, there's no published logic or reasoning to why they did so. So like what we saw was like, but I'm a cheerleader got like an NC-17 rating, despite the fact that media showing depictions of like straight intimacy of like the same caliber would get like R ratings. And that would like keep queer teenagers from like seeing depictions of themselves in movie theaters. So 
now with streaming media, like sometimes there are still ratings at like the bottom on like the Netflix bar, but they don't stop anybody from watching them, you know? Mm -hmm. And so like there is this, this self-created kind of media output from streaming platforms that like never goes into theaters. And so its audience is never limited in that way. Netflix has like a kids only setting. Yeah. Do you think that that could have some of the same issues that other censorship kind of ideas have had? Maybe my, I, it seems like, I mean, this is like my perspective, but like, it seems to me like, like much easier to work around. Like it's much more of like, do parents want to limit the things that their kids see, which is like a whole other problem, right? Like there's a sexual rights thesis where I talk about like the ways that kids like cartoons have been like banned and like protested because like parents think that they're queer, even though like they're Teletubbies, you know, like (laughs) there's all of that, right? So like that is definitely there in terms of like, I know they didn't air the Mr. Rapper and getting married in Arthur episode. Right. A bunch yeah. of places. I, there's an interesting parallel, I think, between like the way that like queer people watch media and are like, this is queer, even if like it was never intended to be. And the way that like often right wing evangelical parents view kids media and say like this is queer even though it was never intended to be (laughs) um and like those are obviously like like just opposing perspectives but kind of doing like the same work interesting so your podcast or not your podcast my this your thesis (laughs) (laughs) had a live component a live performance component and a written component how did you cover the themes that you saw differently or similarly within each of those sections? Yeah, yeah. So um, I had a performance first semester um, and basically my my third chapter is about my performance. And so that my that performance draws from the work that I do in my first and second chapters. You did you did your performance in the first semester but it's based off the work you did for your first and second chapter. When did you write the first and second chapter? Second semester. (laughs) Um, uh, Yeah, it's, I wouldn't say it's a perfect system. It was an interesting process of like, just trying to like shove as much information and like research in myself as possible, right? And I spent like the whole summer before, not having been asked to, I was just like, I have to do something. But I spent, like, the whole summer before, like, watching media on, like, triple speed, like, nine hours a day, basically. It was, oh, it was nuts. Um, <laughs> I watched, like, all ten seasons of The L Word on triple speed. Like, it's very, like, in, you know, like, the world started moving more slowly outside of my computer, you know? Uh, I can't imagine spending a whole summer <laughs> watching TV. That sounds, that sounds awful. <laughs> Terrible. I never wanted to do it. <laughs> And if I hadn't done that, I don't know like how I would have made the show that I made because it meant that like I hadn't done, like by the time that the show was being produced, because I started like the first day back, I was like, okay, the show's happening. And so I was like frantically reading things, you know, but like a lot of the research that I did on like the, the work that I was doing came afterward. And so like the research that I had to make the show was my experience of watching these these television shows and these movies and the experience that the people that I was working with had um, watching like their own media. And so that became kind of a, the basis of the show. It was like, I had recognized these patterns and the patterns, I, so like my first chapter is broken down into the patterns that I see in media. And many of those patterns were used in my performance, but they're not exactly the same because the performance was like, I wasn't like a script that we got and then we made it. And it wasn't like I wrote a show and then we performed it. It was like created by all of us. It was devised. And so that meant like drawing from everybody's experience. And I like intentionally chose people who identified as queer and identified as trans for like the performance, but also like, for the technical production team and for like everybody who was in the room basically. And that became a huge part of like, well, what was your first, like what was the first thing you saw on television? Or like, what was like the thing that 
like made you feel like really weird. You know, like we had like a whole day where we talked about the like Macklemore, Ryan Lewis, same love music video. And that became like a scene in the show. And like, nobody knows that because the scene in the show doesn't look anything like the music video because <laughs> we would never do that, right? But like, it was a like discovery of and like sharing of like personal experiences that often turned out to be like collective. So like I asked people to bring in their like the first thing that they could remember of like queer physical intimacy and media and their favorite and their least favorite. And it was very interesting to see like some people's favorites were some other people's least favorites. People would be like, this like changed my life. And somebody else in the room would be like, I think this is garbage. And like that would become something, you know? And then those became reflective of the themes that I talked about in my first chapter of like violence and like the association of like basically whenever like queer women have sex on screen there's like somebody else like watching or listening or you find out afterward that they're like somehow observing the scene an idea that I studied in my thesis of like homonormativity of like had like homosexuality and like acceptability and like queerness in like heterosexual frameworks that we see in like modern family or like Grace and Frankie of like like white cis male gays having like marriage as like the pinnacle of like queer liberation, right? Mm -hmm. So the show was about like looking at those things and identifying them and putting them, broadcasting them. So in the show we had these like huge screens basically um, at the back of the stage that like the whole show were playing like cut together clips of queer physical intimacy that I had like gathered. Um, and that my video designer had gathered and like contrasting those basically with what was happening on stage. So like taking that work and making something that felt more reflective of like the communities that we wanted to see um, and also like explicitly resisted, right? Like made room for like where there was violence to like have healing and to like where there was like isolation to find community, right? And like pushing back against those things. Wow. Is that your question? Yeah, no, that, that yeah. was great. <laughs> I, I can't believe you fit it all into one chapter. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you come up with this as a piece? How did you come up with this as a research? You said that you had already started in the summer. So was this something that you had been thinking about for a long time? Yeah, so I always say that, like, I didn't mean to be, like, a media studies major. Like, I've never, never done anything <laughs> in media studies, and then, like, I accidentally did a media studies thesis. But, yeah, so I, I've been thinking about physical theater for a long time, working with physical theater companies for a long time. And I study, so I, like, do investigations of three different physical theater companies in the second chapter of my thesis that I basically, like, use the work of to create the show. And so that was, like, a medium that was set up for me. And I did an internship at a physical theater company last semester or last summer that like made these interesting connections for me between like physical theater and, and queerness. Um, because it was like, it's called Streb Extreme Action. And it's like founded by this like lesbian who's like absolutely fucking nuts. Um, and like, just like loves to like throw herself off of like high things. And like she, her goal is to like, her goal is to, like, make people fly. Okay. She's like, people can fly. I believe that people can fly. She's, like, a thrill seeker. And, like, everyone that works for her is a thrill seeker. And I am not. But I've worked <laughs> for them for a while. And it was really interesting because I knew that, like, the, the company was founded by someone queer. But what I didn't know is that, like, everyone who worked for her was queer. And I was like, and their shows, like, don't have any plot. That's not, like, explicit. And so I was like, what happened here? Like, how did it come to be that you like made this like extreme physical theater company and everyone who works for you has like this sense of queer community? Yeah. So that motivated you towards creating something similar at Reed? Yeah. Um, so it was that, that piece. And then like, I had been, so another like proposal that I had for my thesis was a musical that I had written a couple years ago. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, Wrote a musical. <laughs> <laughs> um, I took this playwriting class at Reed my sophomore year. 
um, with Kate Bredesen that was like really great. I'd never written a play before. I like didn't know anything about anything. And then basically the, the structure of the class was that she was like, write a, write a play like every week. And I was like, this is, I'm going to die. <laughs> you know, like, I was like, this is horrible. <laughs> um, but then like at the end of the semester, I'd written like 15 plays. And I was like, I've written 15 plays, you know? And like what the, the last like four weeks or something were like a process of like taking a play that you'd written at some point in the semester and like making it bigger and like working on it and finding more characterization and stuff. And so I wrote this play that semester that was like just, it was just like what happens when we write shows that are just like queer people having like a good time where like no one dies and like no one gets like horribly injured and nobody like gets their heart broken. They just like get to like live and like do like mundane things and like find housing and like have jobs and like do you know do these things that are like really basic but that we never see yeah and so that became like a bigger show and then that summer I spent the summer writing this musical about like queer love without tragedy basically thanks and so that became like the second piece that I was like I can use physical theater and that's like a combination of dance and theater and like I can use this idea of like finding like love and community in like queer relationships. So the, that's kind of a combination of those two things. Nice. So it all just came together into a <laughs> yeah. beautiful piece of art and a great thesis. <laughs> yeah, what was the outcome of your project and was it what you expected it would be when you started? Mm. Hmm. No, I don't think so. So the, the outcome, I don't know what the outcome was. I think the outcome was that I like learned that like the questions that I was asking were like way too big for this project. I, when I like had my thesis orals, um, Mark Burford who was on my orals board was like, you wrote three theses. And I was like, uh, <laughs> I know that now. <laughs> um, and like, because to me there is like, as like a queer person and as a performer, there's like this intimate relationship between like queerness and performance. But there isn't, like, intrinsically, you know, like, there isn't for everybody. And so part of this project was, like, figuring out how to explain what I felt like was intrinsic about that link. Um, And I think, like, yeah, the outcome was that I was, like, this has, like, these are all books, you know, like, this is, this can't be, like, one thesis. Like, this is a great beginning. But I, what I learned was that there was, like, so much more to know. And I really... I didn't know. Like at the beginning, I was like, this, like, how will I ever write 60 pages on this? And then in like, in May, I was like, so I've written like 200 pages and it (laughs) barely scratches the surface. You know, like it was like, wow. So I should be looking out for that 800 page book, my (laughs) saga coming soon. (laughs) Yes. On just like one section of the first chapter of my thesis. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I like walked into my thesis meeting in like, whatever September and was like so I want to do like a whole like my first chapter is going to be like a whole history of all of queer physical intimacy and they were like maybe like a smaller portion of time maybe like three movies and I was like I will settle for 10 years you know and like chose the 10 years where like the most media had been produced and I like got to the end and was like maybe three movies like would have been a good idea what 10 years were, were did you choose so I did 2010 to 2020 because like Netflix and HBO and Hulu were all like founded and beginning in 2010, basically. Um, so I wanted to say like, these are the 10 years of streaming media. Mm, nice. Okay. So did you face any unexpected challenges during this project? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, like. Other than the obvious. Right. You, the you, most you, notable Got sent home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did you yeah, go just, back to Canada or are you still I did. in? Okay. Yeah. So I really tried Ooh. to stay in Portland. Um, there was that process of like, because I live on campus, I was mm-hmm. in HA. And so, like, the process of like thinking the dorms weren't going to be closed, and thinking the dorms were going to be closed. And then, like, basically, like, my partner and I, like, ran to Canada like because the, the we like basically like got a news report like it was like we it was like we filed to stay on campus and then it was like 
within 48 hours, the US Canada border will be closed. And we were like, we gotta go. Yeah. Like we gotta run. But yeah, so that was definitely like the biggest, the biggest challenge. And it was like, it felt, I mean, obviously it was like, it, you know, it, it was, it wasn't like worse for me because of my thesis, you know, like it was like horrible for everybody. And it was like, especially, I think like the class of 2020, it was like a collective, like, oh shit, like yeah. what is going to happen? And like, how do you finish your thesis without like the promise of Renvair? And like, mm-hmm. how do you finish your thesis without anybody else around you who's finishing their thesis? Like so much of this process is like running into people and being like, are you okay? <laughs> um, and so that was really hard. And it, it was hard to think about and write about physical intimacy when it yeah. like wasn't possible. And it was really weird to think about like, we could not make this show now. Like this show was completely about physical touch and like being close to each other. You really lucked out choosing to perform first semester. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I would like get messages from people who like worked on the show and were like, what would this look like now? And I was like, I have no idea. And like, it was really painful. Yeah. What skills did you acquire or strengthen during this experience? My like chaos and distress tolerance increased a lot. (laughs) Um, Like I, which like, I think is kind of been true for everybody in the past few months. Um, Yeah, but I am, like, I'm a person who, like, really wants things to go a certain way and who, like, really wants to be in control of what is happening. And even aside from, like, COVID, making a show from nothing with people who, like, mostly have never made a show before is, like, absolutely terrifying and is, like, a, is, like, a degree of like chaotic that I like simply was not prepared for. (laughs) Um, And I love all those people so much and I'm so happy that I got to do that. Um, But I don't think that like before I entered into that process, I was like, oh, it'll be definitely like three times as hard to make a show from nothing and then like choreograph it. And also like a show from nothing that reflects like your personal experiences with physical intimacy. Um, Like I didn't, I was like, this will be fine. I think I think there's like a level of passion though from actually having them talk about their their experiences and actually putting that into the show and all of that that probably helped a little bit with the chaos. Totally. Yeah, and I think at least we, they're acting well, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and like I think that everybody who worked on it was really passionate about it like up until the very end, which is a really hard thing when like up until the very end means like the last two weeks you've been working until like three in the morning I like really could not have been luckier with like the people that worked on the show and I just like every day I was like I cannot believe that you're all still here this is (laughs) chaos um but then you know at the end everybody was like but it was fine like it worked out totally fine so I think a lot of the chaos was like me trying to navigate everything like hold all these plates in my head you know Mm -hmm. and like lead a team of people to something that was a show I vastly underestimated like the emotional toll that it would take to to make something like this, which I think is like part of why, like part of why we talk about like why are like straight people, like why are cis people like making queer media? Like why are queer people yeah. not making queer media? And sometimes they are, like sometimes they are. But a lot of the time it's like, that's where the misrepresentation happens, right? And And we talk about like, why does that happen? Well, partially that's because like people, like the door is not open, right? Like the, Mm -hmm. or the door that is open is like open to like cis white gay men. I think also part of it is like, it's harder. It is like, it's so much harder to talk about it when it's your life and when it's like your experiences and choreographing these like physical and like dance scenes that brought up things for me about my own experiences with physical intimacy and with sex were like, I was had to be like, I am too close. Like, (laughs) how do I get like any farther away from this, you know, while like maintaining the value of the show, which is its closeness. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I like had not anticipated that I would have to navigate. 
but you do you want to keep navigating that i guess my my next Mm. question is how do you think your thesis experience will inform your life after reed totally yeah i think that i do i have to develop like some more coping mechanisms i thought that i had a lot and now i'm like i need some more (laughs) um uh i'm gonna build that pile you know um but i I kind of think like, like I kind of ended this being like, maybe I could write a book about this, you know? I think you could. (laughs) Thank you. Um, And like, maybe, you know, maybe that's like necessary. Like I ended up feeling like I could write a book just about modern family, you know, like (laughs) I could write a book just about the L word, like easy, you know, like um, there's so much there to talk about and investigate and, You could start a podcast. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) I want to know how many podcasts have been started since the beginning of quarantine. I heard that podcast mics were sold out on Amazon for a while, and that was deeply distressing to me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, I think that this has merit for both a podcast and a book, but also speaking of podcasts, I heard that you were on a TEDx talk. I was, yeah. That, that's crazy. Do you want to <laughs> say anything about that? Sure, yeah. I So I did a TED talk with my mom in January, I think, which is a really strange experience. And it just, like, it just came out a few weeks ago, so I haven't, like, thought very much about it. Um, but, yeah, we, so when I came, I came out as trans, like, three years ago <laughs> no, my freshman year who knows um and like to my mom and my dad basically like over FaceTime over like Thanksgiving break and my partner was like out of screen like holding my hand you know and after that my mom and I started writing like letters back and forth and she's a business ethics professor and so she doesn't like she didn't study gender before before this, before I came out really, or like at least gender outside of like a binary, but she started to have a lot of questions and like about like what being non-binary and being trans, like what that looked like, what research was there about that. And she started to be like, it really broadened her spectrum of like personal learning, but also like academic research. Um, And now like all of her research is like through the lens of like ethics, through the lens of intersectionality and like, she so she is now like really invested in those issues but basically for the last like few years we've written like letters back and forth about like how I'm doing and like what transitioning means and like how like all of those steps come together and like what questions she has and like and all of those things and last summer last summer and a couple of summers ago we've like presented at academic conferences together and one of the things that we presented is like this performance of like some of these letters is both of us are interested in like breaking down some of the um, boundaries of like what academia and performance look like. Oh, did, did this play into your thesis at all? Or is this just a fully separate realm of performance and themes? I think kind of like, I think it like, it has to do with many of the same things so like, yeah, so like those letters became the TED talk basically that we performed and that was happening at the same time as this thesis. And so like, I think that it's hard for me to separate them completely. And some of the questions that like, I don't feel nearly as much anymore, but that I remember writing in like 2017 of like, if I like transition and like, if I am non-binary at like a, anywhere other than like at read, like, am I going to be like a person who is like worth loving? And like, am I going to be a person who can have relationships and who can be like seen as desirable by other people? Those are all questions that are like intimately connected to this thesis, right? And like the ways that media has taught us that like queer and trans people are not desirable are like, to be laughed at and to be disgusted by. And that the idea of like having physical intimacy with the queer person or with the trans person 
is like something to be reviled and like often punished with like violence and the idea that like we can't you know we like queer people can't see ourselves as desirable unless we like see Mm -hmm. unless we see ourselves as desirable you know like unless we physically see it so and I think like media has deeply influenced the reasons why so many of us like have those questions and the like disgust and like self-hatred that many people feel toward themselves have so much to do with like the disgust that we have been taught and the hatred that we have been taught that like queer and especially trans people deserve to be met with and where we have seen that is like in on-screen media yeah well that's i'm i'm just like i'm impressed by the amount of research you did I'm impressed by your subject, how personal it was and how you were able to continue to work on it and just create a beautiful piece of art. I really hope that you do write your book or come out with a great <laughs> podcast. Um, I, I just, I, I don't know. I'm floored by your, your topic. I, I wish I had seen your play. I'm going to say that, that I didn't actually get to see it, but yeah. Your tickets were sold out so many nights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have any more questions for you, but uh, I don't know. I, I'm going to keep thinking about this all week. So thank you. it was great hearing from you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for doing this. No problem. Thank you so much for <laughs> participating. <laughs> Thank you, Saga, for your time and for telling us about your thesis. Thank you for listening, and I hope you join us again to talk to more seniors about their thesis and better understand why you'd want to burn your draft. Burn Your Draft is a production of Reed College and the Center for Life Beyond Reed, created jointly by students, alumni, and staff. This episode was produced and engineered by me, Reed College student Frank Tangerlini. Our executive producer is Seth Paskin, class in 1990 with technical advising from staff member Joe Janiga. Nate Martin, staff member in class of 2016, is our project manager. Music by Jack Salvucci, class of 2020, and podcast art by alumni Henry Gotchlik and Lillianne Pham, class of 2020. This podcast was made possible by a gift from Seth Paskin. Another shout out to Jack Salvucci. You can find them as Boy Talks on Spotify, Bandcamp, and more.